Okay, so today we're so excited to speak to Michaela Johnson. But first, I want to just give you a quick intro as to who she is. Michaela Renee Johnson is a licensed psychotherapist, freelance writer for the Mountain Democrat, which is the oldest publication in California. She's also a public speaker, a small business owner, and an award-winning published author. She lives in Northern California with her husband, her son, and a homestead full of animals. So we have an animal lover with us today. We That's do. <laughs> And then Michaela also enjoys traveling. She's visited over 19 countries, which is amazing. She loves the ocean and everything in it and rarely finds herself without an activity, whether it's hiking, yoga, teetering in the garden, golfing, reading, and so much more. Um, she loves poetic quotes and all things metaphysical. So we have that in common, Michaela. <laughs> so today we're gonna talk to her about not only about her new book, well, I, I think you have a book prior to teetering or after teetering, rather. Yeah, I have a yeah. class and some children's books, yep. And some children's books. We'll, we'll go over those. Okay. Um, I read Teetering on Disaster, which was really a fantastic read. Thanks. So today we're going to dig in and ask Michaela um, a lot of questions, not only regarding who she is and what she does, but how she can help folks discover their true happiness. Am I right, Michaela? Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. So the first thing I want to dig into is how did you manage, because for people that didn't read Teetering on Disaster, which I hope they do, because like I said, it was really a great read. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Okay. Um, just give us a little bit of background about like the living conditions that you experienced when you were growing up. And how did you get from there to becoming a licensed psychologist? Sure. I think um, when people initially hear that, you know, it was a 27 foot fifth wheel in the middle of the wilderness with no running water and no electricity, you know, they picture like shambles. And the truth is my mom is incredibly anal retentive and she's kind of a clean freak. So um, in spite of the living condition, she was actually, um, she really made it home and she really made it, um, you know, it was very well put together. And in spite of not having electricity and running water, it didn't stop her from jazzing it up and making it as nice as she could within the means that she had. And same, same for my dad. Um, he's also very particular and things like that. So the outside space, all of that was very well put together and very well maintained. So I think, um, I think for me, there was this idea that just because we couldn't afford uh, to live maybe in the way that they would have liked to didn't mean that we couldn't still live with some integrity and some pride of ownership. So I think that's really important when I, when I saw, um, you know, that question. And when people ask me that question, I, I like to elaborate on that a little bit, because I do think that regardless of your situation, whether, you're renting an apartment or you're a roommate um, situ you're in a roommate situation with someone you can still you can still create home out of your space and you can still bring yourself into your space and you can still have a lot of pride of ownership yeah and they'd have to read the book to really understand that and see like as I was reading it I was I kept saying to myself what incredible parents you had truly. Um, you know, they made sure that you celebrated Christmas and had pets and stuff. So it was really, and they were such hard work and folk too. And still are. <laughs> yeah, still are. And they, you know, had a really amazing sense of family. And, and, you know, it's funny because a lot of folks don't understand that concept. They think that you need all these material things to be a family unit. And clearly you don't. So thank you for explaining that to us. It's important. And again, I hope folks read the book because it's like once you start reading it, you you literally don't put it down. It was thank great. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. It was great. So I wanted to um, ask you a few questions about, you know, what you do. You're a coach. You do counseling, right? You're a licensed psychotherapist. How, because a lot of people... And, and the statistics that I'm reading are very anxious, very depressed. Social media has a lot to do with that. And they can't discover their path to happiness. So what is it that you can recommend folks do 
to stop like looking and comparing you know with everybody else and just learn to discover their own true path of happiness yeah it's such a great point that you bring up more than ever we are um insanely connected as a society but yet still so incredibly lonely and that gap is probably getting larger and larger as people do engage more in social media and um you know re put so much weight on what strangers on the internet are saying about them or um they're you know engaging in ways that have less connectivity than human touch for example which is such a powerful tool um often even in my psychotherapy practice i literally prescribe a 20 second hug as homework because the oxytocins that are released from that process um, that's some of those happy juices that people need to to receive and um, we are very capable as humans of tapping into our need but uh, we go to our phones more often uh, for that instant fix and um, it's truly sad that uh you know we put so much weight in the number of likes that a photograph has or the uh, number of comments or the way people are commenting about something that we've posted and i'd love to see more people get away from that and start to utilize the resources that they do have in their community because uh there there are so many resources available in the way of book clubs, uh, you know, different meetup groups that do hiking, hiking trips and things like that. Uh, a lot of the old IWF halls and BFW halls, they have all sorts of opportunities for connection. Um, so I think, I think just realizing that humans have a very distinct need on a very cellular level to fit in to society. It's, it's hardwired into our old reptilian brain to be a part of the pack. And um, that pack does not have to exist on Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> um, it can very much exist in real life. And, and that can be a much more powerful tool to um, obtaining some of this kind of happiness that we talk about. And people often ask me, you know, what is the secret to happiness? And the truth is there is no secret to happiness. It's so unique and so independent for each of us. Um, I was just on a podcast yesterday kind of talking about this idea that you might see someone doing something and think, wow, that is so neat. I think that's so awesome. I'm so jealous of that. For example, um, perhaps they are traveling the United States in a van. So that may be the definition of one person's happiness, you know, waking up in a new place every day uh, and putting your feet on new soil and having these new life experiences in different towns and eating different foods, that could be the definition of happiness for someone. But for someone else, that can be the definition of anxiety, right? Like I want to be in my home space. I want to be grounded. I like my living room. I don't want to go see the world. I'm perfectly good where I'm at. So uh, happiness is such an independent thing. And when we're looking at what everyone else is doing, and we're seeing it through their rose-colored glasses, the, the visuals that they're giving us are not necessarily the reality. That van broke down and probably cost 1500 bucks to fix, and they were sitting in the middle of the desert in 120 degree weather, right. wishing they were at home in an air-conditioned house with a cup of sweet tea, you know? <laughs> so I think it's important to remember that happiness is so independent and so unique, and it's not, found in external factors. And this is the other thing that I see a lot. You know, someone says, oh, this cup of coffee, it makes me so happy. And my morning was so crappy, but the minute I get this cup of coffee, I'm going to be happy. And then they go through the drive through and the line takes forever and the barista is a jerk and the coffee is burnt and then they spill it on themselves. And now that coffee, coffee did not make them happy at all. It contributed more to their anguish. So right. happiness, uh, and we can talk more as, as we go along here, but happiness has to be found intrinsically. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, a lot of folks that I know, um, are, they, they, they're so, like you said, alone. And they, the thing is they get up, they go to work, they work hard all day, and they're basically alone at work. That's how they see it. Yeah. Even though there's people around them, they still feel alone. Mm -hmm. Then they come home. And, you know, eat dinner and then play on their phones and go to bed. And this is what I'm hearing 
as to why they're so alone because they're seeing these Instagram pictures. They're feeling so disconnected mm. from the rest of the world and all they do is compare themselves. And then they're in bad relationships, a lot of them too. <laughs> so, you know, they're getting hit from all ends. But I like what you said about going to groups like a book reading club or something where they can relate to other human beings. They don't realize the importance of that. What can they do? If I mean, and I know that this is just conversation, but maybe it'll spark some type of idea in someone's mind to try to pull themselves out of being unhappy. But for these people that are in bad relationships and they're, you know, you experience that right as well yeah. in your past. Um, how do they get out of this trapped relationship? How do they muster up the courage to do that? Well, I want to touch on something that you said just before the relationships, and I'd love to dive into that as well. And the first thing that you said is, uh, you know, people who are lonely. And I definitely want to draw a distinct difference between um, being alone or feeling alone and feeling lonely or being lonely. Those are two totally different things. And if you look at, a, you know, the life of a Buddhist monk, they are incredibly alone, but yes. they don't they don't attribute loneliness as one of the qualities to their life. So I think that um, when we're in a space of feeling those sorts of emotions, we really need to ask ourselves, am I feeling physically alone? Am I feeling alone because there is nothing around me in this moment? Or am I feeling lonely? Because I could be sitting on a mountaintop completely alone and feel completely fulfilled. Or I could be sitting on a mountaintop completely alone and feel incredibly lonely. And when we understand the route to why, then we can dive into what we need. And I think a lot of times we don't, we don't, uh, we don't attach the why to what we're feeling. And so it's important that we dive into the real meaning behind what we're feeling so that we can actually address the issue. Because if you are, you know, I know plenty of people who, are surrounded by people and feel incredibly lonely. Um, yes. So we have to really look at, at the difference there. And, and that is from the space in which we can start to make change. And so um, if you are feeling alone because there is nobody in your physical space, then maybe you need to consider getting a pet. And, um, you know, maybe your apartment doesn't allow pets. So maybe you need to look at other situations for engagement with people. Maybe you need to consider volunteering at an animal shelter where you can go spend some time with pets. Um, so it doesn't always have to be a human connection either. And um, maybe it's a lizard you know, or a chicken. Maybe it's not a cat or a dog or something like that at all. Uh, so seeking out opportunities there for engagement that create a space where you don't feel alone, where you have somebody else with you. The loneliness issue, that comes down to needs. And so, um, you know, if I'm feeling lonely, it is on me to look at why. And if my why is because I'm depressed, because of some recent loss that I've had, then I would take an approach down that path. And it could be different for everyone, the reasons that you might feel lonely at any given time. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't want to project what, what anybody could be feeling. But when we understand the reason and the why, then we can tap into our need. And from the space of our need, we can start to look at ways to, to get what we need. Mm -hmm. So if, I, um, if I'm feeling sad, then maybe I need, because of a recent loss, and that is the reason I'm feeling lonely because nobody understands what it's like. Nobody in my life can understand what it's like to have lost my spouse or something like that. Then maybe I need to start looking at support groups for grief and loss. So it, it directly ties, our need directly ties to the why and the need is the key to the solution, if that makes sense. It does. So how do people discover what this need is? Do you recommend counseling or like what would you say to a client that came to see you with this type of issue well if a client came to see me they would already be a couple of steps ahead because they're in the hands of somebody who is knowledgeable on this subject so counseling is always i think a great option because again humans have that basic need for connection and to belong and so if you can just talk 
with someone who is not going to pass judgment on you, that can be hugely healing in and of itself. But in situations where people maybe can't afford counseling or something like that, mm -hmm. um, and even in the work that I would do with clients, I like to always use the onion reference. So everything that they bring to me is the outside layer of the onion. Everything that we get into is the core of the onion. And um, what's interesting is, is that sulfuric gas that's released from peeling back the onion that really causes a lot of the, the anguish. But once we're at the core of the onion, that pain is pretty much gone and we're pretty clear on what we need to do. And so to get to the inside of the onion, I, I highly recommend journaling. Um, I think that can be a great tool for people who have never journaled before, this can feel very daunting. So there's a couple of things that I like to suggest. Um, I personally have an Amazon shop that I share with clients because it's got all of the tools and resources that I suggest for them. There are wonderful one minute gratitude journals, self-care journals, um, you know, morning gratitude, evening reflection type thing just to get you started on the idea of writing. Um, the other thing I recommend is maybe you want to go to the store and actually touch and hold and pick out a journal that you really love, pick out a pen that you really love. Cause if you hate writing with this pen, you're never going to sit down to the journal. Right. And then I recommend putting yourself in your journal. So going on the internet and finding quotes that you really resonate with writing them throughout your journal. And I, I always find it's incredible that when you get to that day and that page, you needed that quote. And it's like your past self sent your future self a message. It can be a really powerful thing. And to start writing in your journal, I just tell people, I suggest that they sit down and just write the weather. Just talk about the weather. Everybody can talk about the weather. It's an easy thing to talk about. But what it does is it brings you to the here and now. It creates a space of mindfulness. And then it starts the idea of I can come to this space and talk about how I feel or my perception of things and not have to be judged. And it feels good to be here and just get to do this. Mm -hmm. So I think that can be a really powerful tool. Just write the weather. And it's amazing. My clients will come back to me and they will say on day one, two, and three, I wrote the weather <laughs> on day four, five, and six. I wrote how the weather made me feel. And on day seven, I wrote four pages. So wow. yeah, that can, that can be a great tool for getting. I to love that idea. That's, yeah. that's a great bit of advice. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Like how did you come to be, uh, get interested in becoming a psychotherapist? Like what drove you from, from point A to point B? Sure. And you asked that question earlier. I'm sorry that I. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> we want to know more about you. So, it, you know, when I was growing up in the living situation that I was growing up in, I had this grand idea that I was going to do it bigger and better than my parents did. Um, I, you know, wanted to go to college. I, I would have been the first in my family to do so. I was so driven to just see the world and get out there and experience life and gather things. And by that, I mean houses, cars, all of that. And I kind of ran down that path. Um, it's interesting because when I was in high school, I wanted to be a journalist and I wanted to expose all the evils of the world. And so when I went to college, I went with the intention of getting my bachelor's in journalism communications and then realized that there was a lot more money to be made in sales and marketing <laughs> and then reporting the weather in some snow town <laughs> somewhere. And so I, um, I worked in sales and marketing while getting my journalism communications degree. And in my mind, I attributed money to stability, to never having to live in a trailer again, <laughs> kind of a thing. And so that was really where my drive was coming from. And um, I kind of ran down this marketing career and had endless opportunities. I traveled about 100,000 air miles a year and felt incredibly unfulfilled. And um, I really felt like I'd done everything there was to do in that career. I loved the idea of getting into people's psyches with sales and marketing, um, but I just didn't feel like I was living my life purpose at all. And so I, uh, at that time, was going through a very challenging relationship and um, we just talked about in teetering and went uh, to see my own counselor and I went into her office and she sat on this fluffy couch and she took off her shoes and she put on her blanket and I thought 
that is the job. (laughs) (laughs) That is incredible. And so I really, at that point, um, just was so in love with the idea of helping people that there was something more that I could do. And at the time I was, um, writing teetering as a blog before blog was even a word before bloggers were even a thing. It was on like this very simple, like WordPress kind of, um, website. And so I, I, uh, was putting teetering out there and the crazy thing is people were responding to me and they were saying, Oh my gosh, I feel so incredibly, um, inspired by your words or this is exactly what i'm going through or can you tell me more about how you did this because i need to do that Mm -hmm. and so at that point things just kind of started to connect in the way where i started to actually listen and i don't feel like i'd really done that i all prior to that i was coming from a space of this is what i want this is what i'm gonna get and that's it. And then I started connecting with people in my life who were more metaphysical or more spiritual. And Mm -hmm. they started saying things like the universe always lines up. And I wanted to understand that more. I had this deep desire to better understand how I could have everything that I ever wanted and yet be so unhappy and feel so unfulfilled. And so at that point, I started doing a lot more listening work and um, really diving more into myself. And through that process, I started to realize um, that my path was going to look different and I was not going to be so concerned anymore about the end destination or the end game or where I was going to wind up, but I was going to focus more on the journey. And um, when I started doing that, when I started focusing on those universal messages and focusing on the journey, things started to fall into place and everything started to come together. And everything that is behind me is all a part of the building blocks. It's all a part of the Jenga, I like to call it. Um, And there were some blocks that made things tumble. Mm -hmm. Um, And there were some blocks that really built a sturdy foundation. So that's kind of how I came to be a psychotherapist and get into the field that I'm in. Um, And it's a lonely field. It is incredibly lonely at times. There are times where um, you see a client for a short period of their life and then you never see them again. And, you know, you have this hope that that little ways that you held their hand and walked with them had some positive impact and that you did no harm and you just don't know. And then sometimes there's days where uh, years later, a client will call and say, you saved my marriage. And I know that we stopped coming to see you, but um, we've had this thing come up now and we'd love to come back. And it's like, wow, that's neat. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a lonely process to be in this field and it requires a lot of grounding. It requires a lot of self-work, self-care, and um, I wouldn't change it for the world. I absolutely love what I do. So it's, it's amazing how life led you, you know, to the place that you're in right now. And you've written all these wonderful books. Tell us a little bit about the books. I know you said children's books. What, what are they? Tell us, you know, where we can find them and what they're about basically. Sure. So I wrote Be You Find Happy a while ago. It actually started as a book called Vintage Living in a Hectic Modern World. And really I wrote it as a very quick self-help read for my clients (laughs) because I was like a repeating record. I was like, do this, do this, do this. And you'll, you know, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? What about this? And so then I realized, you know, it would would be really great if I could just put all of these concepts in a simple read because clients are like, I don't have time to read. I I just, nope, it's not going to happen. And so this is a Be You Find Happy is a simple ebook. It's, I call it the happiness starter kit. It's really some, what I consider to be basic therapeutic tools to get people on their way for a very inexpensive cost if you can't go to see a therapist. Mm -hmm. Um, It was never meant to be kind of like this great thesis on self-help. Um, but I think it's just a great resource more than anything for my own clients. So that's kind of where that came from. The children's books that I've written have all come from a space of, um, I have a young son, he's eight and over the years, just the different things that he's experienced or gone through. Um, 
in the way of, you know, finding his bravery or being able to be still and focus in class. Um, Cause so many kids these days are, you know, required to sit in class for so long and humans were not meant to sit like that for extended periods of time. Um, especially young children. Yeah, they would have been out helping pick berries um, in right. caveman days and things like that. So all of the children's books have an underlying theme of um, something that I've experienced with him as a mom and um, are intended to help other kids in a playful way using animals as um, the character. Great. And of course, I'll have the links um, I'm sure they're for sale on your website, which yeah. we'll also have links for, as well as on Amazon, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. So, awesome. So um, you say that happiness is a choice. Now, a lot of folks may think that that's um, like a blanket statement, like, oh, you know, you can choose to be happy. How can we really choose to be happy? Like, you know, you clearly made a decision growing up in, in, I mean, let's face it, you didn't have electricity, you didn't have running water, well, at first anyway, running water. And for a lot of us, that would seem impossible, like impossible living conditions. But yet you were happy. You were really, you know, you made a decision to be happy and you lived a wonderful life. How can folks really know what that means to choose their own happiness? So it's it's funny my sons so we've had a i'm just going to share the story because i feel sure. like inspired to do so but <laughs> we've had uh where i live here in northern california there's been all this wildfire and uh so pg e our local gas and electric company has been shutting people off for their power for days on end like five right. days to prevent wildfires that's the and, rolling blackouts right that they're yeah having? yes yeah. and it's, so it's going to be coming up again this week we're solar so we're very limited impact but my <laughs> But um, but sometimes we choose not to do the things that we need to do to have power when the power's out, just because. And so <laughs> my son said to me the other morning when he woke up, Mommy, I had a nightmare. And I said, yeah, what was your nightmare? And he said, we had no electricity for seven years. Oh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was like, hmm. Yeah, that does sound like a nightmare. And then later we had a conversation and he says, Mommy, I heard that and he actually we were listening to a podcast playback of a podcast that I was on in the car and he said I heard that you had no power when you grew up as a kid and this isn't something I've shared with him yet he's eight years old you know right. and I and he goes is that or, he goes is that true and I said yeah it is true I said you can ask nanny and pops they'll tell you <laughs> And um, his face was just kind of like, oh, my gosh. Um, but the thing that's important to remember about happiness is that it's absolutely a constant reset. So there is always somebody, something, an experience that is going to take your happiness. It's going to strip it right away from you, and you are going to feel unhappy. And, you know, what's incredible, I, I read this, um, Tish Nhat Hanh wrote about this in his book, You Are Here. And he is an incredible author. Um, so many great, great theories on happiness, especially. Um, but he says, in order to experience true happiness, we have to experience great pain. Mm. They can't exist without the other. So right. we have to know what it feels like to have lost or to have felt pain or anguish to be able to appreciate the happiness that exists in the thing. So, um, so yeah, happiness is a choice because every time, and it will, that something yucky or uncomfortable or painful happens, it's up to us to look at this situation and say, what was my role? Where did I have a say in this? And uh, how can I look at this experience objectively and, and take from it what could be considered happy? What could be considered a growing experience? some moment that I can look at this and say, yes, that is what I got from this. I'll give you an example. The other day, last weekend, I was supposed to fly to Half Moon Bay for the pumpkin festival. That did not happen. So I made plan B. Um, after I found out plan A wasn't going to happen, I was super bummed out. I was like, oh, man, I've been looking forward to this pumpkin festival for six months. This was like the only, you know, pumpkin-y thing I had planned and now it's not going to happen. And so then I made plans to drive um, to a destination to meet up with my husband. We were going to have dinner with our son and um, it was going to be a great like kind of little getaway instead. 
Mm-hmm. And then that didn't happen. That wasn't going to happen. And I'm like, okay. And so as it would turn out, my parents were moving and they needed a lot of help. And I knew how important that was. So I went to help my parents and it's very stressful. They're bickering. They're bickering with me. <laughs> you know, I'm like trying to play peacekeeper and I'm like, this is not at all what I was supposed to be doing. I'm right. supposed to be sipping a pumpkin spice latte. This is not <laughs> making me happy. I'm really upset. But then we're at this storage facility, which is like super ugly, right? Storage facilities are not pretty. Mm -hmm. And it had been cloudy all day. And all of a sudden the, the cloud layer lifts and the sun pops out from underneath and it hits these storage units, these metal garage doors. And it just shimmered with gold. I mean, absolute sparkling pixie dust beauty. And about that same time, my son found, as we're moving stuff, this little rover thing that my dad had had for when he'd broken and he'd had a surgery. And so he's puts this rescue dog we got a week ago in this little front cart thing. And he's riding it around like Toto or like E.T., you know. Absolutely. And I, I just had this moment of like, I wouldn't have gotten to experience this if I'd been there. Right. And this is the beauty. This is the moment. This is the happiness. And just be here for a minute and just do this and just enjoy this. And um, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. And so I think it's up to us. And when I say happiness is a choice, that's what I mean. You're going to be angry. You're going to be sad. You're going to feel pain and anguish. But it's up to you to look in those situations and find that happy factor. That's so true. I, I find that happiness is so fluid, you know, like you can wake up in the morning and like you said, be just miserable. It could be horrible out. And then later that day, just be beaming with joy. And it's a good thing to remember all the time, just how fluid it is and that it changes and it doesn't have to be that way all the time. So even if you're on, cause I know like one person in particular, <clears throat> they were unhappy for weeks. And they thought that they were going to stay always unhappy. Yeah. And then one day that changed. And that one moment allowed that person to see that even though you're unhappy, you, you're not going to stay that way forever. And I think it's important for folks to know that too. Absolutely. Um, a lot of the people that come to see me, not all, but a lot of them, they're in in, they're in such a dark space or they're going through something that is so incredibly painful, like the loss of a child or something like that, yes. that, that the word happy isn't even in their vocabulary right now. It's, it's not even on the radar. And in those situations, you know, we're not looking to find happiness. We're not looking to think everything's going to go back to normal or anything like that. We're just trying to get through the day and try to use what's around us to find something that we can hold on to for a minute. Mm. Maybe it's a few minutes outside taking some deep breaths. Maybe, maybe it is that cup of coffee in the morning. Something to help you get through that raw, excruciating pain. And um, in those situations, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not talking on this level. We're, mm -hmm. we're in a different space. And sadly, all of us are going to go through that too. And our resiliency and our grit is what comes into play in those situations. It's, it's tapping into that human desire to survive and um, making the best choices that we can in the moment and giving ourselves a whole lot of grace and mm -hmm. saying, it's okay for me to feel the way I feel now. It's okay for me to not want to leave my house today. That's okay. I'm allowed to feel the way I feel right now. And I think that um, a lot of times there's this pressure to like get back to normal and it's never going to go back to normal. Um, you know, the future happens forward, even if we're falling, right? That's the direction we have to go. And it's okay to accept the way that the past was, or to look at the past and be unaccepting of it. That's okay. It's just about falling forward. So. Oh, I love that. That's so inspirational. Um, tell us a little bit about what services you offer on your website. 
Yeah. So um, right now, I actually am just launching. This is really incredible. Uh, how to de-stress um, the holidays, and so that's going to be an online webinar, like a real live webinar, where I will be. Um, providing tips and tricks, very tangible tools to be present and actually enjoy the season and not have it just get away from you. And people will be able to ask questions and um, engage live. So that's going to be coming up next month in November. And then I'm also really excited. So these are new offerings for me in the past. They've always been um, in-person workshops. Mm -hmm. And then in February, I'm actually teaming with uh, Shireen Oberg from the Law of Positivism on Instagram. And we are going to be doing an intention setting workshop live. She will be leading a guided meditation. And then we're going to be doing tangible tips and tricks to setting goals and intentions that are actually attainable. And then she's also doing an oracle card reading. So it's, it's going to be a really fun oh. hippie webinar. Yeah. Now, is this announced on your website currently? If folks go there, they can see how to sign up and. Yes, yes. And I'm also offering a special discount for that one. The November webinar is actually free. Um, and then I'm offering a very special discount for people who sign up for the February one that heard about it via some of these podcasts and stuff. They can enter the coupon code podcast and get a really Wonderful. nice discount. And yeah. I'll make sure that I, I, you know, blast that across the screen as well as in the article that I'll be sending out to. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Of course, of course. You know, we, we really want to be able to get the message out to folks that, you know, they don't have to be anxious. They don't have to be stressed. They don't have to be unhappy, that there are ways to get help out there. And your message is such a beautiful one. And I was so inspired by you. Thank you. I just had to speak with you. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, I'm so honored to be here. Well, thank you. And I know that our listeners are going to flock to your website to, to <laughs> join the webinar too. It sounds, I know I am. It sounds great. And I also can't wait to read your, your book. Um, what's it called about love? Be, uh, oh, so there's Be You Find Happy and then that's there's it. also that's Me and Mo, which is the fiction book. And that's, that's the book about love and that's a fun one. But I have a new book coming oh. out, still kind of top secret. Um, but it's a nonfiction narrative um, that is very, it's kind of like a collection of everything that I've been sharing in a very inspirational, but like kind of like tough, gritty kind of way. Like, girl, you got to do this kind of thing. Oh, nice. Dude, we're going to make this happen. So, yeah, I'm excited <laughs> about that. Sometimes that's good. A little tough yeah. love is good. A little tough love, because I had a whole lot of tough love. Uh -huh. And so um, I really feel like that's my true personality. And I don't feel like that came out in Be You Find Happy. Um, I feel like that was still being found and teetering on disaster. And so I'm really, really excited for this read because it's just like authentically holy me. And I'm very ready, but it is in agent phase. So it's. Oh, what's the, do you know the title yet? I do, but I'm going to keep it on the job. Oh, okay. <laughs> We'll have to wait for the surprise. <laughs> yes, yes. I, but I will definitely be, um, you know, announcing it all over social media and all that fun stuff. Wonderful. So Wonderful. So any parting words um, that you have for us today? Any bits of wisdom that you'd like to tell us or unpack? I just think that you will experience sadness, anxiety, depression, um, people in your life, things in your life that you love that bring you great happiness are going to bring you great pain. And um, just know that this is all a part of your story and it's beautiful. And uh, this is not what the next chapter is going to look like. And this is not what the next book is going to look like. And I believe in you. You've got this. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having and again, me. I'll make sure that all, everybody has access to all the links. And can they email you if they have a question? Oh, yeah. if like, okay, great. There's so, a contact can, button on my website and I always okay. respond to email. Um, that's actually one of the best ways to get in touch with me. So yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. I'll make sure I blast that as well. Cool. Thank you again, Michaela. Thank you. We'll talk to you again soon, hopefully. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.